Here we go with with a bunch of bunch of crap here. <laughs> That sounds goofy to me. I don't like it. Hey everyone, and welcome back to another video. I often get asked, what were you thinking about during that solo? Oh man, that was kind of cool. What was that? And you know, if it's right afterwards and it's in the moment, it's really hard sometimes for me and I'm sure lots of you, if you got asked this, to be able to recall what you played and really kind of analyze it and help someone out and tell them what you did. The only way I'd really be able to tell someone what I did is to listen back to it and then go through it with them. In real time, it's just not possible, but fortunately, a lot of you have transcribed a whole bunch of my solos. I'm really grateful for that every time someone says they took the time to learn, write down, transcribe one of my solos, and then I get asked all the time, okay, hey, now I did this transcription, what were you thinking about here? And I've, you know, answered that person in the email or the message or whatever, but a lot of other people have been asking me to do this as well, so I'm going to start a little series where I say, what did I play in this solo? The most requested solo that I've been asked to talk about is my acapella version of It Could Happen To You. A bunch of different people have transcribed this solo. I'm really appreciative of that, by the way. But for the purposes of this video, I'm gonna use the one that I guess has the most notoriety online, and that's by Ben Urig. The original recording that I did of this solo was at the end of a lesson that I was giving in person. I always like to demonstrate things on the horn at these lessons, and a lot of times at the end of the lesson, I'll just play some stuff a cappella to really kind of wrap up what we were talking about. And I happened to record this, and I put it online because the student really enjoyed it and they wanted to hear it again, and a lot of you enjoyed it as well. If you want the PDF of this solo completely free, all you need to do is go to the top of the description down below, there's a link there, or you can just go directly to davepollock.com slash it could happen to you. Right before I jump in and start breaking down this solo, I wanna hook you up with something. If you don't already know, I have a PDF book with 25 diatonic exercises in all major keys called Strictly Major. It's amazing for building your technique on any instrument and in any key. And if you've ever wondered what to practice to increase the facility on your instrument, this is it. Along with all 25 exercises written out in all keys, I actually have a video that goes along with it where I demonstrate and talk about each of the exercises. For the rest of this month, April 2024, you can get this book at a $10 discount. It's normally 25, so you get it for only 15 bucks if you use the code JAZZMONTH. That's right, April is Jazz Appreciation Month after all. The link to get this is in the description below, right under the link to get the free PDF for the solo, or you can just go to davepollock.com slash store. Make sure you grab your copy before the end of April so you get the discount. Yes, it'll be available after April, but you won't be able to get this $10 discount. Now I'm gonna jump into the PDF and break down the solo. All right, as you see, we're now into the PDF. This is the solo, and the first thing I'm gonna do is actually just play the solo in its entirety. It's about two and a half minutes long, just so you can hear what it sounds like overall. Then I'm gonna go back and start breaking it down and analyze what I played. If you don't want to hear the entire solo, you just want to get to the breakdown, jump to this timestamp right up here, <laughs> somewhere up there, and that'll take you right to when I start actually breaking the solo down. So first, like I said, I'm going to play the entire solo all the way through, uninterrupted, then I'm going to go back and start from the beginning. Here we go. <laughs> Oh. 
All right, so that's my solo a cappella version on It Could Happen to You. And now I'm going to dive in here and uh, kind of talk about it. So first, I play the melody, but as you heard, especially if you know the melody to the song, I got away from it kind of quickly. Once again, I was just doing it at the end of a lesson, demonstrating something to a student. So is that the best example of playing the melody? Uh, probably not. But, you know, I just happened to record it, so that's what we have. Uh, so here we go. I'm going to start playing it from the beginning, and then we'll I'll stop here and there. <laughs> So even right there, ba 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 do da ba do da do da is the normal melody. But when I play, I just wanted to add some notes in there. That's something that you can do, especially when we're talking about neighbor tones. If you watched my free masterclass, the best way to create melodic solos, I talk all the time about using neighbor tones, lower neighbor, upper neighbor, enclosures. Da do da do do da. Right there, I use a bunch of enclosures, neighbor tones, and stuff. Uh, so that's what I'm just using. Even in the melody, you can do that. I like using side D a lot. Kind of go D to D flat-ish. Uh, it's a cool sound. You know, Cannonball uses it a lot. Um, well, a lot of people use it a lot, but it's a fun sound to use. So right there is something that I do a lot when I'm playing a cappella, and I do it when I'm thinking about filling in a phrases when I'm thinking about playing melodically and then also adding things. The melody here, there's usually just a pause there, but here, I kind of did a chromatic line, going from the flat nine here of the A7 flat nine, B flat, landing on the third here of the D minor, bop, and then I instantly jump up to the melody there. So that's kind of what I was thinking uh, in that section, just filling it in between the melody. Same thing there. So the normal melody. There's like two measures there of really nothing. So what I did... And then starting here on the C major. So I played kind of just in C major. Then here I played a minor 2 5 going to A minor. Think about the, the enclosure here A to G to G sharp, upper lower chromatic enclosure leading to the G-sharp here, that's the third of E7. And then F natural, flat nine, F natural, D-sharp, that's chromatic enclosure leading to E here, the fifth of A minor. This enclosure stuff, like I talk about in my free masterclass, the best way to create melodic solos, my six-step voice leading process. If you haven't checked it out, go to davepollock.com slash free masterclass. But I go over all these things, how to create them, what they are, why they make sense. And I do that here a lot. I just do it in my playing all the time. And it shows itself uh, right here, even in the melody. Ah, so here, I do this half step up thing that a lot of people do. Instead of just a long 2-5 of a measure of D minor, measure of G7, then C, I go, I play a 2-5, a short 2-5 up a half step. So instead of D, G, I play E flat, A flat, D, G. So I kind of play some notes here that lead into ish. Uh, I play E flat minor, as you hear, and then I probably meant to play C or B. I'm 
not sure what I did there, but <laughs> I'm not sure why I chose C and A, but whatever it works. So the E natural here to the E flat, which is that flat 13. It's a great sound. Nine of the two chord, E over D minor. Flat 13 over the five chord, E flat over G, leading down to the third here. Great sound. Nine, flat 13, third. Great sound. I just kind of added a bunch of crap in the middle. <laughs> So I just basically so I sort of played the melody. Ba da 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 da. I sort of started the melody, then I just kind of improvised, just playing, you know, D minor here. Ba da 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 da. I sort of played uh this, you know, F sharp half diminished to B. Seven is a minor two five in the key of E minor, but it doesn't obviously resolve there. So I played like the E harmonic minor scale with a couple extra notes, but I resolved right here on the C major chord. And then I get back to the melody. Ah, Dick Oates. Dick Oates right there. Um, I sort of played the melody that I filled in again. I'm doing a lot of this chromatic, or not chromatic, this um, triplet thing. But I guess at that time I was really into that. This was, I think, 2018, 2019. You have to check. I believe it's 2018. So six years ago is the time of filming this. Leading to the A7. That's a Dick Oates thing where he kind of plays a phrase that you you know is going to resolve. That's where it's going to resolve, right? But, but then I'm not going to mess it up. But Dick Oates loves to do that where you kind of resolve right on beat four with the color tone. So with the flat nine here, right? He, that's the color. Where's the resolution? I kind of play it on the beat two here. I go, -da 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 -da. so I don't really resolve. I mean, I kind of do. It's a great tip. You don't always have to resolve everything. You know, when you work on your two, five, ones, whatever you're doing, sometimes, you know, you can do some different things to create the tension and don't give the resolution either right away or at all. If you're very confident in your playing and the phrasing makes sense, it'll sound cool because it's not just going to sound like you forgot to play. It's going to be that tension and then you're going to do it. It's like, ooh, and eventually you'll resolve somewhere else and then it'll release. But it's a little uh, trick that I kind of stole from Dick Oates there. <laughs> It's not the harmonic minor stuff. I, you know, anytime you have minor two five or a two five leading to minor harmonic minor scale of the, whatever the one is. So E to A would be a D harmonic minor featured in that flat nine there, the B flat. That's common stuff that I play all the time and a lot of people play all the time. Now we're technically getting into the solo, even though I haven't really played the melody barely. Syncopation. It's great. Rhythm, 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 rhythm. When you're playing acapella, one of the things that I always liked to do harmonically is to be able to play a solo where people would know what the tune is or at least know what the changes are, right? Because you want to be able to hit the changes, not play everything so square where it's, you know, you're just playing chord tunes up and down. That's a good starting point. But eventually get to the point where you can play more creative stuff, but still hear the changes. But then what happens is when a lot of people play acapella, they always start right on the beat because they're like, I don't want to get out of time. There's no drummer. There's no rhythm section. Ba, ba, da, ba, da. You don't have to do that. If you have an internal pulse and you're thinking rhythmically and you're thinking like a rhythm section, you're breathing the way you're tapping, the way you're moving your fingers, all that is going to contribute. So when you play syncopation, it doesn't sound wrong. You still hear where beat one is. If I back it up a little bit, you'll hear exactly where the beats line up, even through that syncopation here. <laughs> Okay, so now we're going into the, the changes and I kind of play pretty standard, just major stuff here, but I, I anticipated it once again. So C major, but in the end of four, B flat here is the flat five of the E minor seven flat five, E half diminished of the next measure. I anticipated by half a beat and then rest. So even though I played it in the C major measure, it's 
even though I rested, the last note you heard was that B flat, so it carries through. And then common, to, well, I guess a neighbor tone, but common tone here, F, 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 F sharp, right? Just goes up a half step because I knew D minor going to the chord, F sharp, you can play F sharp. Common thing there. So the, the, the line being the G here to the F here, beat one, beat three, beat one. Those are the big beats of the measure, one and three. Ba -da 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 -da. So here's two upper neighbors. We want to talk about voice leading again. This is why you got to get my master class for free. I'm telling you. Ba -da 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 -da. Two chromatic upper neighbors. And then we have an upper lower chromatic enclosure into the E here. Okay. I did this rhythm again, but now we have A7 flat nine leading to D minor. Still thinking that D harmonic minor sound. So the note B flat is great. Uh, F natural is great. C sharp, great. You know, those are all great notes to lead into D minor. There we go. Five here, A, ba to the A flat here, flat nine. You A lot of times I like to lead down to G, which would be the five of C, but I went to the third instead. So a lot of the things I'm noticing now in this solo, listening to it and seeing it, is I'm playing a lot of like linear scale type stuff, but I'm kind of jumping around, right? A lot of people might go... But I'm going, I'm bouncing back and forth. It's still not complicated harmony. If you understand major keys, I'm playing, you know, so far major stuff, you know, harmonic minor scales, like standard kind of just jazz bebop language, but I'm bouncing around a lot, like the shape is bouncing. So that's a tool to use in your playing as well. Just when I say, you know, use the C major sound, it doesn't mean you have to play just linear up and down. I think I did a video here on YouTube where I said how to sound out by just playing a C major scale. And I talked about using intervals, using fourths, fifths, sixth, bouncing around using different rhythms, different articulations can give you a different sound. So in this solo, I'm kind of using that doing these skips, bouncing. This is just an A harmonic minor scale here with a little enclosure at the end, B to E. More enclosures. So going two chromatic below and then skipping up above and then landing on the third there on B3. It's all like you can figure this stuff out if you know what to listen for, what to look for. But on the surface, if I just play it, whoa, what is that? But it, it's really not uh, as, as I guess, cool as it first sounds. I don't know. <laughs> I can explain it all. So, you know, uh, I'm not Chris Potter. I can't play the crazy stuff that he plays. Um, he can explain what he plays. Uh, me, because I'm a, a normal human being, not a uh, complete genius like him, can't. So there we go. <laughs> There we go again, the half step up. And then a lot of time people go. Something like that. But just kind of playing the major scale a half step up. So I'm thinking D flat major there. There's that sharp, I mean, well, technically E flat, flat 13. And uh, Ben just absolutely knocked this arrangement or arrangement, this transcription out of the park uh, with these five tuplets, all these little things in here. And remember that this audio record audio recording quality is just like a phone, you know, just in someone's house. So it's not like it's a clean, super clean audio. It's only saxophone playing. Yes. But, you know, it's, it's hard to hear some of those little details. And he just absolutely killed it. <laughs> There we go. Two chromatics below, jump above, 
and then I jump below again, and then finally technically resolve there on the D minor. Just ch chromatic enclosures, diatonic closures, leading tones. It's just it's all you know standard stuff if you know about voice leading. So I'm thinking, once again, E harmonic minor. Using the sharp 11 there, even though it's only for like one eighth note triplet, but that, that F natural, I love using that. Over a minor 2-5, but once again, it resolves to major. Uh, just using some triplets of rhythms will set you free. And here we go, some larger intervals here. G up to G, but uh, F up to F. By the way, I, I still play this line right here. Uh, but that should be an F natural. I messed that up. Or I played it so sharp that it sounded like an F sharp. Um, that that high note should be an F natural. If you if you want to play this line for yourself, I mean you can play whatever you want, but I like playing F natural there. But what I'm doing, same thing. I'm just thinking harmonic minor. Ba -da 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 -da. That's the sound. It's just uh, a D harmonic minor because it's a two five going to D minor. Yeah, I messed that up. I messed that up. <laughs> so there you go. Using the flat nine of the G7 there um, and not really playing the third of it. Uh, so that's a thing I do sometimes too, apparently. Harmonic minor again. This song is all about these harmonic minor, these minor two fives. Uh, once again, this this is it's not that I'm playing anything crazy or whatever. I'm playing just standard harmony, but I'm kind of shifting it around and really bouncing around a lot. Did I have to jump down like that? No, but you know I like doing that. It adds so much uh, to the playing. I think. So I just play a just like a C blue scale. C blues. Even though it's going to C major, I just wanted a bluesy sound. Are you allowed to do that? Yeah, of course. And when you're playing acapella, absolutely. So right there, I do like kind of the Coltrane-ish, um, you know, Tad Dameron-ish. Yeah, except I don't play the, the A flat and the D flat there. I kind of land on the note A flat, but then I play some you know, dominant bebop stuff here. And then more enclosures. Ba -da -da, going back. Right there, same thing again. It's a lot of the same thing. Hopefully this is shining light on, you know, what I played here for you because a lot of this is repetitive. Once again, I'm playing right here just down a D minor chord at the nine, but then I anticipate the next measure because this is all leading to E minor, right? F sharp minor seven to B seven. So you think E harmonic minor, the note E flat or D sharp. I could have done something like that, but I wanted to go. I kind of jumped up to the higher E flat, featured some other notes there. Remember, this is B seven. So that's, you know, the G sharp or a, a flat there is eh, not really technically in that chord, but don't kill me. Okay, here we go. Let's keep going. Just a little rhythmic motif. Boo -dee -do -bop, ba -dee -da -bop. Just trying to keep following the changes while, while not being kind of beholden to them to have to hit every chord tone on every measure. Kind of using a motif, hitting maybe one note that sort of fits that keeps everything moving forward. That's another tip when you're playing acapella, not only just acapella, 
But I think the best improvisers are also the best at playing acapella as well. You can still make a great solo and still keep the harmony moving forward, keep the listener's ear going for the entire chorus, for the entire solo, but without being so obvious about it, obvious in playing, you know, every single chord tone, every single, you know, third to seven and third, you know, you can kind of forego some of them, but everything still keeps moving forward without a rhythm section. That's something to practice. That's why I love playing acapella because it forces you to learn to do that. Enclosure, enclosure. Look, enclosure here, enclosure here, enclosure here. Uh, two chromatic lower neighbors here. This is like, literally, if you've watched my masterclass and this is the first time you've seen the solo, it's like, oh yeah, oh, that's right. That's number two, that's number four, that's number three, that's number five, that's number one, that's number six. All this stuff I talk about in that masterclass. Cause that's the way I like to play. Okay, hold on. All right, let me go back a little bit. Why are we have all these notes over G7? Okay. Is that G7? <laughs> no, uh, it's a B major triad. Right? Why did I play that? Well, I'm a D G7 usually goes to C, goes to C here. I did a whole video about tritone substitutions and super easy way to play a tritone sub sound or get the sound of a tritone sub is play a half step below where you're going to resolve to. So if you're resolving to C major, on the dominant chord before it, play a half step below that, play B major. I go into the details of B major triad is basically the three, five, seven of G sharp minor triad, which is the two in a two, five, one G sharp minor to C sharp, which is the tritone sub of D minor to G, blah, 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 blah. If you're confused right there, go watch that tritone sub video and uh, it explains it in uh, more detail and slower than that. But basically I'm just thinking B major triad here. And this is why I like to teach the way I do. I play the way that I teach because I don't want to have to think about what I just explained to you. That's way too hard for me. D sharp minor seven to C sharp or G sharp seven. That's no, no, no. Or what I, no, that's not even right. No, G sharp minor to C sharp seven. That's too hard. What if I just think play B triad with a little upper lower enclosure at the end. But and up. doesn't that work? It sounds good to me. If you heard it over the changes, it would work even better. Let me back it up. Right? Seems to work. And all I'm thinking is just B major triad. But once again, you have to have the voice leading in and out of it so it doesn't just sound like you're going. Right? That doesn't work to my ears. But when I do this, this seems to work for me the way I kind of got through it. So let me back it up one more time so you can listen for the voice leading in and out of it. A harmonic minor. Phrasing. I'm not just playing eighth notes all the way through. And so there's some articulation things here. And, and Ben, once again, knocked it out of the park. Once again, that's probably stolen from Dick Oates. I love when he plays like staccato stuff. He'll be playing whatever kind of. I just love that sound. It's it's cool to me. It breaks up the the really legato eighth notes. So I, I like to throw that in there. But once again, more triplets. Right, just kind of playing down the minor uh, chord there. E flat minor, up thinking up a half step again. Back it up a tad. There's that B major triad again. All right, without the chords playing, it might sound a little goofy, but um, that's that tritone sub kind of sound, thinking a half step lower. Here we go with, with a bunch of bunch of crap here. <laughs> Another harmonic minor. And then I play some other chromatic stuff here. 
So that that right there, that cracks me up. Um, the, these four eighth notes, I hate, I don't like hearing that. It, I don't like it at all. I messed, I'm hundred, almost hundred percent sure. I just like my fingers got like, uh, what am I doing there? I didn't mean to play four eighth notes in the middle of this long double time run. That sounds goofy to me. I don't like it, but it's here. It's, you know, this is, this is the thing when you put things on recordings or online, they're there. And, you know, especially if people start transcribing them, it's no matter what I do with my original video, this lives on. So there's those crappy four eighth notes, but uh, whatever. <laughs> so uh, harmonic minor, just some chromaticism, but I'm always thinking about connecting the chords. That's why I'm so big on horizontal playing versus vertical. Horizontal being connecting chord through and into the next chord, into the next chord versus just play a chord, then play over a chord, then play over a chord. Uh, so here we go. So sometimes I superimpose changes to like lead to themselves. So I was kind of in like really anticipating early that E minor because I'm not really playing F7 there. Sure, you can say, oh, I'm playing the nine and the third and the sharp 11 and the 13. I, I'm, it sounds like I'm just playing C major there. Great, I've played that before in the solo. Um, here we go. Harmonic minor with some chromaticism. Really, I'm playing. But I added extra notes so the notes line up on the beat. Uh, if you notice, beat one, C sharp, beat two, or beat two is A, beat three is E, beat four is A, beat four is F. So it's the third, the one, the five, the one, the third. Chord tones. If you land on chord tones on downbeats, you can almost play anything else, and it doesn't it doesn't really matter. So I'm playing a, a basically a G. Uh, how do you want to, what do you want to call this? G seven flat 13 flat nine. It's really an A flat major seven. I shouldn't have played the, the, the C there. That should be a B. I messed that up. That should be a B natural to really give the, the augmented triad. I'm pretty sure that's what I meant to play. But I played C there, whatever. Let me back it up so you can hear the whole double time line one more time. Um, and just really think about like what I'm talking about with this just harmonic minor sound. Listen to the voice leading. It's it's not complex. It's just I'm adding a bunch of extra crap there to fill in space. And by the way, was I really thinking of like five tuplets and these 16th no, no. <laughs> I may have just added a note by accident. My finger slipped or whatever. Um, but he has to notate it somehow. So there you go. I love doing the, these kind of like little triplet things. People ask all the time, like, what is that? So here you go. The the line, here's the line. You got to take the eighth notes. Watch. So we it's C on beat one and a one. Da, da, two. And a two, three, and a three, four, and a four. If you just play those as eighth notes, that's the line, which is basically a D harmonic minor, starting on, of course, C natural, but which is not in the harmonic minor, but it's roughly the same sound. But then you add the little triplets. I don't know how I played that triple at the end. Did I really play that? Maybe I played up to C. I don't know. I have to practice that. <laughs> but that's that's kind of a thing. And this is why understanding when you practice, understand overall sounds versus individual licks. Did I really work on that specific lick before? No. But I've worked on... Or... And then maybe combine it 
you're thinking about sounds, you're thinking about overall shape, you're thinking about color, you're thinking about, you know, harmony, you're thinking about the bigger picture. And then the micro is like the individual little phrase or something, right? You're, you're not in real time. I'm not, this is why I don't think you should transcribe long parts of solos and just copy and paste and put them in. Transcribe a line, transcribe or a whole solo, but pick out the sounds that you like and why you like the sound. Like, for example, here, you might say, oh, I like how you descend, you're playing the harmonic minor sound, and then you add triplets to it. That's what I'm doing. Now, this, what, that's the lick, right? That's literally what I'm playing, but what I'm doing, the sound is, there's a descending, harmon roughly harmonic minor scale that leads to the five. There's a little enclosure at the end, and I add some triplets during it. Now, you can change that in any way you want to create your own version of that. That's just what I happen to do. It's not just copy my lick and then play it in your solo and say, now I'm good at soloing. That's just copy and paste. Anybody can do that, okay? Uh, so here we go. Ah, finally, something diatonic. Here we go. <laughs> And then, of course, I have to ruin it the next couple measures. All right. So here's another example of like, just think overall sound. I'm basically thinking play everything that's not in the key of C major, right? It's a one, six, two, five, one, diatonic six. So A minor. So even... Even um, less options for like really hitting the chord because it's just all C major. C major, C major, C major, C major, C major. All those notes are not in A minor. They're not in C major. But all I'm trying to do is think, start the phrase. So I anticipated it right here. That's my C. So I'm telling everybody I'm on C and then I end right here. What I play in the middle here is like almost arbitrary. I'm specifically saying I want to play wrong notes, hashtag wrong notes only. Shout out, Ryan. But what I'm doing is using intervals, doing the, the shape of the line and then resolving it. So it leads in, it leads out. So harmonically, we're cool. In the middle, there's a lot of color tension, Ooh, but I do resolve it. If I just went... Uh, what is that wrong oh i can't even play this so in in real time it kind of makes sense back it up a little bit so you can hear it it's always leading forward and that's that's the goal and that's kind of the the key here is you know, everything in this solo, it, it kind of makes sense because of the way that I approach improvisation, which is, you know, thinking about, okay, what is the melody? Let me use the melody as a guide. What's the harmony? Okay, I'm going to make sure I think about the harmony throughout. Doesn't mean I'm going to play every single chord change. Doesn't mean I'm going to hit every single chord tone, but I know where the harmony is leading. And on top of when I say harmony, I don't just mean D7 is this. G7 is this, E minor is this. It's what is the chord telling me? Because a D minor as a two chord leading to a G7 to C is should be treated differently than a D minor that had an E half diminished A7 flat nine before it because I would treat that as a minor one chord with resolution into it versus the D minor starting a two five one, okay? Now you can combine those, sure, but harmony to me is a collection of chords and it's a collection of sounds, and it's how the sounds are used, which is why I think knowing jazz theory, music theory, whatever you want to call it, is important, because just saying, oh, the notes of F7 or F, A, C, E flat, that's great, but that doesn't tell you anything. Yes, it tells you what the literal chord tones are of that chord, but what is it, what is the chord saying? And this gets, into, you know, not without getting to, you know, head in the clouds, philosophical, well, what is the chord speaking to you? What I mean is like, is it leading this way? Is it leading to minor? Is it leading to, like if I just see just blank G7 to C major, I'm gonna think of that G7 differently than if I just see G, the same G7, but then after it is C minor, context, context, context. This entire solo, I'm always thinking context and that's kind of where I think. So sometimes I'm not even thinking about the exact chord tone or the, the, the exact notes of the chord. I'm thinking about what is the sound? Like at the end here, 
I'm not, do not, by the way, do not analyze this as, okay, B flat, the flat nine of the A minor, then E flat is the, 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 the flat five in the, no, no, I'm playing C major here, not C major here, C major here, literally. Now, I have to know what C major is. I have to know what C major isn't. I, you know, did some intervals, but bigger intervals are always going to make it sound more modern and, uh, you know, less linear and bebop sounding. But overall, that's how you get that more out sound. You play notes that are out and then you play rhythms, intervals, things, articulations that are going to be out as well. That's what I thought of there. I'm not thinking of individual chord tones and how an E flat you know, re reacts over a A minor chord or a B flat over a D minor. That's that's not the point there. All right, I hope you enjoyed that deep dive into my solo over It Could Happen to You. I hope you understood a lot of the things I was saying in this, especially when I was not talking specifically about the notes, but when I was talking about what I thought of, like I was saying at the end there about playing out then playing in without thinking too specifically. Sometimes I was thinking very specifically, sometimes I wasn't, but that's the way I play. If you're not at the level yet where this stuff is gonna work for you, that's totally fine. Take it slower, but I just wanted to kind of show you what I was thinking through this song, and that's kind of the way I think overall. If there are other solos that I've done that you want me to kind of analyze like this, let me know, put it in the comments below because this was fun for me to actually go through it and kind of explain it because I've done this with my students in the past in person and in you know other lesson situations, but I haven't done it here on YouTube before. It's kind of strange listening to your own solo and talking about it, and especially when I hear things that I don't think I wanted to play, but that's the, the nature of you know music, and I'm not the person to say I need to play a million takes to get something right. That was the first take of that. Almost every recording you ever hear of me online is the first take. I don't really like to do multiple takes. You start getting into your head and then you start trying to craft a solo. I know I'm going off on a tangent now, but you know, I think it's all related. You know, I like doing first takes and that was a first take. So there are gonna be things in there that I don't necessarily love, but that's why I'm always on to the next thing. So I encourage you to do the same thing. If you put something out there, it's not perfect. Don't just sit there and dwell on it. It's already out there. Go on to the next thing. It's all good. Nobody's dwelling on it as much as you will. So just let it go and don't worry, everybody else isn't gonna, you know, be talking about that one note you played wrong. Don't forget to grab the PDF of this solo completely free by going to the link at the top of the description below or just go to davepollock.com slash it could happen to you. Also, don't forget to pick up your copy of my PDF book, Strictly Major, by going to davepollock.com slash store. I'll put a link to that down below as well. You can get $10 off if you use the code JAZZMONTH in honor of Jazz Appreciation Month. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.